So what Covenant House does is sit down with the young people who come in. We serve 56,000 people in the US, Canada, and Latin America each year. Some of those are we reach out to by um, outreach vans or by the um, nine line for kids who are in crisis. That's 1-800-999-9999. And um, we also shelter at least 1,700 kids a night in the US and Canada. When a kid comes in, they have an interview with an intake worker and talk about what their hopes are. Some of them want to go back home and have counseling help to get, work things out with their families. A lot of them don't have that option because their parents have kicked them out or because their parents are no longer on the scene. Um, a lot of them want help getting their education, so they'll get a GED or they'll get help getting into college. Uh, for kids who've been in the foster care system, Covenant House can help them get their Chaffee money. There's federal funding available for former foster kids to get to college. Um, there's a big push to help kids get jobs. And in all the um, 17 different cities where there are Covenant Houses in the US and Canada, if you get a job and have um, a an income coming in, you're able to go to transitional living, which provides an apartment, and you pay rent for that, but that rent goes into an escrow account that you get back at the end. So after a year or so of transitional living and life skills training, you'll have a savings account so that you can get your first and last month's rent paid and start living alone on your own in an apartment. So um, the reason it's called Covenant House is because the kid and the counselor make a covenant with each other. The kid will say, I'm gonna, this is my plan, I'm gonna work to fulfill it, and the counselor says, we're here to help, and we're, we promise that we'll help you as far as we can. So um, uh, it's, it's, it has a really good success rate for kids who stay in the program for a long period of time. 70% of them are able to live independently after coming to us as homeless kids. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit about a population of kids that we see quite a bit of and where there's some research that I find particularly hopeful in, in how to help um, this group of kids. Um, kids who are gay or sexual minorities um, make up 40% of the shelter populations of youth shelters in some cities in the US. Oftentimes their parents aren't dealing with that issue and kick them out, reject them, tell them just to get out of town. And that was the case with the young woman in, in, in Los Angeles whose, whose grandmother kicked her out the day she found out that, um, that this girl named Megan was gay. So Megan was living on the streets um, she tried to call her family and, and make up with them, but they wouldn't take her calls. They told her never to call again. She went back to her apartment and saw all of her possessions in the dumpster and went couch surfing for a while, stayed with some friends from high school, and eventually heard from a friend of a friend about Covenant House. And she went to live there in the crisis center and went on to live in um, the Rites of Passage Center as well. She was studying to be a massage therapist. She had a wonderful gift of healing. Um, as a student, all of her clients would say that she was really wonderful at this, and she loved having that power of taking other people's sadness into her body and making them feel better. So she was doing well in that program, not in school so much, because she had she had some um, learning disabilities, but she was doing really well in the massage therapy program, but she had to quit because she insisted on sending half her paycheck home to her grandmother and her mother. They would, they, they would not take her calls, but they still knew her cell phone number, and they would call her up when the insurance bills were due or the phone bill was due and ask her how she was doing, and she would say fine, and they'd say, well, we're really short on money, and she would end up sending back home to them, even though they'd kicked her out, half of her paycheck. Um, so she had to quit school. She almost had to quit transitional living because she wasn't able to save the required amount of money, but they cut her some slack on that. Um, there was an interesting moment the last time I, I sat down with her after most of the book was written. I was out in LA and, and I met with her again at a coffee shop and I asked her how things were going. 
she said that her grandmother had seen a daytime TV show where a transgender man and his mother were reunited after the mother had kicked the transgender man out. And the man had gone on and gotten terribly beat up on the street and came back to his mother and there was this tearful, sort of joyful reunion where the mother felt horrible and was opening up her heart again to her son, who had been her daughter but is now her son. And the grandmother, Muriel's grandmother, was watching this show, it's a Spanish language show, and, um, and realized that she needed to call Megan back and sit down with her and say, look, I don't want that to happen to us. I want us to bury the hatchet and I want you to come back and live with us. So um, the way the book ends now, she's deciding whether to go or not. And um, she has since decided to stay back with her family. They've had some sort of reconciliation. And she was in massage school full time again. So that was a good story. <laughs> um, but the research that I found most interesting that came out of that chapter, uh, there's a woman named Caitlin Ryan in the University of San Francisco. Um, University of California, San Francisco, who has done a lot of research on that moment when kids come out to their parents. And she interviewed 155 different families um, whose young people had recently come out to them as either gay, lesbian, or transgender, and kept a list of all the different behaviors that the parents showed to the young people. You know, positive and negative. She divided it into positive behaviors and negative behaviors. She found out that when the parents were very rejecting of their child, that the kids had a eight times higher chance of suicide, homelessness, drug use, and um, risky sex behaviors, which is which is pretty pretty remarkable. The ones whose kids were felt very accepted and loved after coming out to their parents had you know, much fewer um, incidences of, of those bad outcomes. But what I found most interesting was that the parents who had been just kind of rejecting, not totally rejecting, but kind of rejecting, their kids had twice as good outcomes as the parents who'd been very rejecting. And what Caitlin Ryan was doing was giving this list out to parents who were in these situations where they could look down the list of positive behaviors. And if the parents could take on one or two of them, like standing up for your kid if they're being bullied, or meeting their friends, or inviting their friends into the home, or talking to them about their sexuality, um, a lot of those taken as a whole list would be hard for some parents, but they could pick one or two out, and it would make their um, kids twice as safe as they went on into young adulthood. So that research is quite hopeful, and, and we're trying through the book, and, and her efforts are also trying to promulgate that research and get people to realize that even if they're not 100% accepting, those, those small accepting behaviors make a huge difference in the health of their children. And she was saying, you know, all these parents love their kids, they want the best for their kids. Sometimes the rejection that they show their kids is to make their kids safer in the eyes of society, but the parents don't realize that by feeling that rejected, that doesn't help the young people at all. So um, there were some interesting ideas in that area, and that would be another way to reduce the number of homeless kids that we see in a homeless shelter if those kids felt accepted in their own homes. I wanted to um, read a little bit uh, from the preface, because I know there's some um, writing classes in here, and I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what it was like to write these stories. Um, I'd come from a, a career in daily journalism, so I was used to the interviewing skills, but the, the longer term project was a bit of a challenge. I was used to writing 500 word stories and not 76,000 word books, but I, I got used to that eventually, and with the help of a co-author, it was, it was, it was very helpful. Um, so I'll read a little bit from, from my preface. When Kevin spoke about his desire to co-author a book about homeless kids, it sounded like a dream job. The challenges inherent in this project reminded me a bit of those I found in writing portraits of grief at the New York Times. Those short descriptions of the people silenced forever on September 11th, 2001. How do you present a multifaceted life in a way that honors it most authentically? How can you write about searing loss of life, of innocence, of childhood, 
while still inviting people in to read more, to look through the pain and find common ground. Our mission was to introduce some exceptional young people so that readers could feel at home with them, understand their stories, and know them by name, not as those kids, a phrase that seldom leads anywhere good. I had volunteered at Covenant House in New York in the late 1980s and admired the courage of his residents then. Now, as the young people in this book welcomed me into their stories, they convinced me of the commonalities among us all. We all wanted to go to the prom, we all loved our music, we all have shaken our heads at grown-ups, and we all have had people who believe in us. Yet the medal of these six young adults, Polly, Muriel, Benjamin, Crayana, Keith, and Megan, has been tempered by the sickness in their homes and the greed of their exploiters. I wondered how on earth I would have made it through the adversity they faced as babies or toddlers or young children through no moral failing of their own. Those circumstances, which might well have flattened me, often left them vilified and victimized, but here they were, speaking frankly, often smiling. I felt as if I were interviewing marathon runners while I had never even jogged around the block. During my decade at the Times, I wrote many stories about controversies involving marginalized or voiceless individuals, stories on polarized communities and courageous struggles against popular opinion. I reported on the health problems of a Native American tribe living near a Superfund site, a transgender vocational school principal in a rural town, and the lives of children waiting to be adopted out of foster care. I also covered Kevin's efforts to reform New Jersey's troubled child welfare system when he was the statewide child advocate and then the commissioner of the Department of Children and Families. All of these articles I see now involve people whose sense of home had been severely shaken. I never knew how much home mattered to kids who had dangerous family lives. I used to think children would be glad to land in a safe and friendly foster home where they could expect an end to the beatings and careless insults. From working on this book, though, I see that the pull of home, even a scary and sadistic one, is deeply ingrained in us all. Slowly, I came to understand why Benjamin, when he was four, would try to cross a four-lane road to return to the mother who had burned him. To him, she was also the source of the first comfort he'd ever known, and he hoped beyond hope that she would comfort him again. I was amazed by the forgiveness and generosity Megan showed to her family who had kicked her to the curb, and Keith startled me when he turned the other cheek to his mother, who, he was told, had killed his father and then abandoned her three tiny sons. I remember the philosopher Blaise Pascal who wrote, the heart has reasons that reason knows nothing of. So I'd like to open it up for questions. Anyone have any questions? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, sure. I don't have that on the top of my head. I know that it's very small. I know that um, it's easier for them to adopt out younger kids, you know, up to the age of nine or so. But after that, it's much, much more difficult. I did a story for the Times on this thing called the Heart Gallery, which is where a bunch of photographers took pictures of portrait pictures, like beautiful art, artistic portrait pictures of kids who'd been waiting the longest in foster care. And a lot of them were in their early teens. It's, it's hard to find an adoptive family for a, a young teenager. And it's also it's a, sort of a double whammy because the, um, the options for them, if they're not in a stable foster care setting, the options for them are less family oriented. They're more likely to be in group homes or residential treatment centers. And those kids have less chance of being adopted because oftentimes it's the foster parent who will do the adopting. And once you don't have a foster parent anymore, your chances go down. Um, I would say talk to the um, talk to the child welfare system that that would know them the best and would know what their history is. Um, spend a lot of time with the young person, you know, possibly doing a foster to adopt situation so that you get to know them and get to see the um, you know if if there's a good match there. 
it's a it's a wonderful gift to adopt an older child from the foster care system, and I would I would wish anyone could do that, but it's it's also very damaging to the child to get adopted and then have the adoption not work. So um, it's very useful to know the history that the child of what what kind of upheaval the child has had in their past, to to be prepared for you know teenage years aren't that easy to raise a kid through even if it's a birth child, um, to go in with, with full eyes open to know what the problems might be that go over and above raising a teenager. Yes? Yeah, what do you stand states for a teenager and his or her late uh, teens? Uh, chances of success or chances of getting adopted out? Uh, both. Well, um, it depends on how far um, the family, the blood family, has been researched out. Um, if, if the child welfare system hasn't worked very hard to find sort of like the second level of relatives after mother, father, aunt, grandparents, then um, the chances aren't as high as if someone has researched out your great aunt or your cousin who might be able to do a legal guardianship arrangement, even if, even if it's not a full adoption. Those um, situations are better, it's better to age out of foster care to a legal guardian, which is a permanent um, step, one step short of adoption. So, um, but it, it's really hard to gauge what the chances are of getting adopted out at, at you know, late teens. We, we do know that um, some states, I think it's about seven at this point, and we're, we're activating to get more states to adopt this, are able to keep kids in through age 21. And um, the, their results are better. The outcomes for the kids who are willing to stay in foster care through 21, um, they have a better chance of getting a job after 21, of not being a, a teen parent, of getting more education. Um, what we have a whole chapter at the end on how to, how to um, prevent youth homelessness, and one of the recommendations we make is that each state should extend foster care to 21. They get federal funds to cover half of the costs, and that's, that's a really important way to keep kids safe at that vulnerable age. I mean, it's the age that you guys all are. Um, I don't know many people who could just go out and rent an apartment at 18 and survive financially in this job market. New Jersey, one of them? I don't think it is. I don't think it is, but it, it needs to be. Yes? Um, I'm just curious as to what kind of work you were doing with Covenant House when you first went there in the 80s, you oh, said? Oh, yeah. Were you just doing more research, or was it hands-on things? I was, a, I was a volunteer. I actually, I worked at a corporate foundation, and one of the grantees that we had was Covenant House, and I wanted to do some volunteer work, and I thought, oh, I'll just do... Um, one of, one of the grantees, and I had worked in college at a, at a homeless shelter too. I think it, had always, it was an issue that always resonated with me. When I worked at Covenant House, I did intake interviews, and I was like 22, so I was asking kids who were 21 how they came to be here. Um, I was also doing practice job interviews with kids, helping them write their resumes, and the funnest thing I did was a literary magazine. Um, I just, my boyfriend at the time and I decided that we were going to put a box out at the front desk and if anyone had any poetry or drawings or raps or, I don't think rap was invented back then, but um, <laughs> any, any artistic work that they wanted in a literary magazine, put it in the box and we would just, we would Xerox it and distribute it. We didn't edit it, we didn't cut anybody, but um, that was a really fun project and I think it meant a lot to the young people. Um, but in the book, we talk a lot about what people can do uh, in, in, a, in, in a homeless shelter or in other ways for homeless youth. And the Newark shelter is right by City Hall. It's not that hard to drive. And we've had volunteers go in and bake birthday cakes for the kids because a lot of them have never had a birthday cake. A lot of them have never carved pumpkins, never done an Easter egg hunt. And at first, people were like, oh, come on, they're 18 to 21. Aren't they old for that? They're not. They, they kind of love it. I had a friend who just brought down movies uh, on a DVD and made popcorn. I used to go down there in the early parts of the book, and I brought my dog down, and people were happy to see my dog. I taught them knitting if they were interested, and I did, I did manicures. So just for them to know that people in the outside world care about them um, is huge. 
Yes? I'm sorry, mental health? Oh, um, we do get some government funding, but it's a very small percentage. We're, I think, 85% supported through donors. But in Canada, um, they were able to set up, we have a section on mental health, that's what I thought you said at first, um, where, where through the public health service there, they're able to have counselors and on-call psychiatrists in the actual shelter, so kids don't have to go out to get counseling, and the number of appointments made and kept went up significantly, like 90%, and the number of hospitalizations for mental health issues went down by, by two-thirds. So in Canada, where they have a different system, the government help there makes a huge difference. I don't, well, I don't really need that. <laughs> <laughs> What's the a ratio of children per counselor? Do they have like therapeutic counseling or do they do like individual counseling? Um, and how do they deal with the overwhelming amount of issues that uh, these children might have? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's a, it's a big issue. I mean, I think about a third of the young people that we see have had some sort of psychiatric hospitalization. And depression and anxiety are very common among homeless kids. And when you think about it, like if you were homeless, it would cause depression and anxiety. It's almost like a rational person's response to being out on the streets and oftentimes rejected be beforehand. So say on the Newark shelter, I know that they have group therapy sessions. I know that they have um, individual counseling. They have, and those are by people at like master's level, um, counselors, but the, the youth workers, they have three or four per floor, um, maybe 20 kids on a floor. There's always several grown-ups there to help them and to talk through their issues with them. We found in the reporting of the book that it wasn't the counselors as much as just regular grown-ups in the shelter. One of the young women in, in New Orleans who was a Katrina refugee had a real close relationship with the cook. She would go and talk to the cook and, and, and the janitor, and they were sort of her support system. It wasn't that you needed a, a full degree to be the light in someone's life. So um, in Newark, we have an affiliated shelter uh, in Montclair called Nancy's Place, which is um, for kids with dual diagnoses, so um, kids with mental health issues. There's an eight bed house, sort of like a group home there with full time counselors on staff. And they've had a really good success rate getting kids into um, more stable living situations than that and getting them involved in careers as well. Yes? Are there any uh, programs available for maybe people that have come from this background that have had these issues but? didn't go through foster care, didn't get any help from these nonprofit organizations. Are there any organizations that exist to help these adults uh, find counseling that they may not be able to afford and advisement on just what to do from there? I would say if, if it's up to age 22 or 24, you could call the nine, people could call the nine line and ask that question because that is 1-800-999-9999 um, is um, a, a clearinghouse for all kinds of services available for people in crisis. And um, I, I know in, in Essex County, there's um, the Mental Health Association of Essex County would be a good place to go. I'm, I'm assuming there's a similar one in Mars County. So to find out about um, counseling that might be available on a sliding scale or, or for free. Does that, does that answer your question? Huh? Okay. <laughs> Yes? I know that originally um, Covenant House had some kind of a religion affiliation. Is that still true, or do you get any help from the archdiocese or any of the Catholic uh, health services? Yeah, they do, they do get help from Catholic charities. It was originally, but not a ton. Um, it was originally founded by a Catholic priest. And a lot of um, our previous executive directors have been either, have been, well, it was the priest and then two nuns, and now Kevin is the first executive director who's not a member of the, a religious community. 
Uh, a lot of our funding base was from churches originally because that's how the outreach started in the in 1972. This is actually our 40th year. But if you're a kid going through Covenant House, you can go through with you can get pastoral help, but you can also get pastoral help in a variety of religions, and you can go through without ever having to uh, be a religious person at all. It's open to everybody. And I know in Newark, our, one of our pastors is Baptist, and um, I think that's true in a lot of the other shelters as well. Anyone else? I did want to say that the book is for sale. Um, it's being stocked generously by the bookstore. Um, and I don't know if it's, it, is it, it's right outside the door and I'm happy to sign copies. All the proceeds go to Covenant House. I did want to talk about Sandy. That was one thing. Um, Covenant House kids were hit pretty hard by Hurricane Sandy. In particular, our Atlantic City shelter was flooded and kids couldn't stay there. So my co-author, instead of being on the book tour that we're supposed to be on, was um, digging out in Atlantic City, finding extra um, accommodations for kids inland. They stayed, all the kids from the Atlantic City shelter stayed in Deptford for a while, but then they lost power in Deptford, so they had to move further inland. They went to Philadelphia, where the roof started to fall off, and they had like 200 gallons of water in the basement. So it's been a challenge, and they were about $1.2 million um, in the hole from the cost of the repairs and all the um, losses due to the hurricane. But it made me think about how hard it is for kids who don't have a place to stay. I mean, it was scary enough to be a person in a house during that storm. Um, for kids whose refuge might be the subway tunnels or the subway trains, which weren't available, or the boardwalks on the Jersey Shore, uh, some of the kids at Covenant House would stay at what they call the Underwood Motel, which was just under the boardwalk. Um, those weren't options during the storm, so that's a lot of people have asked how did the kids fare during during the, the recent hurricane, and and that's that's how it was. They'll they'll be back up and running, but it's been quite a quite an ordeal. Anything else? Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>